most societies and, and civilizations when facing these uh, technology-driven uh, demands for transformation and reinvention, they break down. But we have a very strong case for a successful uh, transformation. Uh, and that was the way that uh, all the Nordic countries, 100 or 150 years ago, went from being the, the, the poorest non-democratic agrarian societies uh, in, in Europe. We were really dirt poor. Uh, at the end of the, of the 1800s, 30% of the working population in Sweden, for example, emigrated mainly to the US because uh, of hardship. But then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, we had managed this transition into becoming the richest, the happiest, the most stable industrial democracies uh, in the world. And uh, both Lena and I are very, um, uh, we point out very clearly in, in our book that we are now a bit in, in the Nordic countries losing this. But the fact that we a hundred years ago managed this transition so well, that, that is something that is quite extraordinary. And the interesting thing is to understand, try to understand why we manage this transition so well, and to see if there is anything that we can learn from that societal transition into the situation that we are today, when we are facing an equally, if not greater, transitional challenge. And the interesting thing is that back then we had very um, visionary uh, intellectuals and politicians in all the Nordic countries who knew that in times of rapid technological and societal change, and they could see industrialization and urbanization and all of that coming, uh, in those rapidly changing times, it is just so easy for us humans to want to have some sort of external authority to hold on to. We might be looking for a dogmatic religion or an authoritarian leader. But these politicians, they did not want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to building sta stable democracies. And as you mentioned, they knew that you can only build stable democracies if you build them from bottom up. So what they wanted to do was that they wanted to, to help a lot of people in, in the Nordic countries to take the next step on their personal inner developmental journey and become grounded enough in themselves not to need an external authority to hold on, on, to, to hold on to, but rather connect with their internal compass and by that be able to fairly independently navigate this chaotic situation that we had in all of the world, or, or at least all the Western world, around the time before or during the First World War, when these strong forces were acting everywhere in, in the world. Uh, and the way that they went about to do this, to help a lot of people to develop the inner capacities to hold this complexity, and not only hold it, but become active co-creators of the new society, that was quite extraordinary because they knew that this outer transformation has to be connected to an inner transformation. So they created retreat centers, small retreat centers, but many of them. And by the turn of the last century, year 1900, there were a hundred centers like this just in Denmark, 75 in Norway and 150 in Sweden where young adults in their 20s, later on with full state subsidy, could spend up to six months with the expressed aim of uh, becoming grounded enough in yourself and connected with your inner compass to be able to handle this complex situation. And I think that that was a wonderful insight. And I think that is very relevant for where we are today. 
Perhaps we cannot go about creating thousands of retreat centers all over the world, but today we have technology. So perhaps we can use technology to help more people uh, become able to uh, um, handle this situation and to actually independently make meaning of the situation and connect the dots and have the emotional capacity to uh, uh, not freak out, <laughs> but rather think constructively and contribute to whatever new society that wants to be born right now. And th but this program must have been on a massive scale, right? This must have been yes. like tens of thousands of people. Yes, yes, it was a massive scale. And you know, today we are talking about tipping points. So when this program was at its height, almost exactly a uh, hundred years ago, then actually 10% of each new generation had the opportunity to participate in one of these six months programs. And of course, th that created what we today would call a critical mass in society and, and a tipping point and, and made the system be able to organize on a new, more complex, but perhaps also more elegant way rather than breaking down. And I think that, that that are actually the numbers that we need to see today. We do not necessarily need to bring everyone or, or, a, or a, even a majority up to a level where you can actively contribute to, to the new society that wants to be born. But I, I would say that you, you cannot either really rely on a small elite to do this. You need a substantial part of the population if, if we should be able to to see this through uh, in a positive way. And this was not merely learning, right? Uh, this was like broad and deep embodied experience focused mm. program, right? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that is why I call, call them a bit jokingly retreat centers be, because uh, um, oh, of course this was also about learning. But uh, if you talk about learning in a broad sense, you can make a distinction between what uh, some thinkers called horizontal learning, which is learning new skills, new information, new, no, new knowledge, and vertical development or vertical learning, which involves your minds and your emotions capacities to handle more complex and more nuanced situations. And these programs were, of course, working in both these dimensions. So it, it was very much a question of also learning to uh, see the new technologies that were coming, not being afraid of new technology, knowing that all new technology can be used for good and bad things and embrace the technological change. Um, also learn how to organize civil society and things like that. Uh, but, but the truly revolutionary, at least seen from our perspective, was the um, uh, realization that this vertical component, which you could even call consciousness development, that that, that was an important ingredient. And that we have forgotten completely about today. Today, we, we concentrate 100% on, on the horizontal learning. For a very long time, we thought that we could do almost all of our horizontal learning during our school years, and then we were sort of done with the learning. Now we realize that we need lifelong horizontal learning, but we are still forget forgetting about the vertical aspect. And it is the vertical aspect that will help us to make sense of everything that we learn on the horizontal. What, so when we what, take in what more kind information of... about yeah. Uh, what kind of activities were were uh, were in place for th this vertical learning? Mm, yeah. So th then you can go back again to what we touched on earlier. What what would this vertical learning include? Well, it includes this sort of deeper transformational skills. Uh, it's a matter of, for example, learning how to in a complex situation, in a rapidly changing situation, not shut down our instinct when we become afraid and when things become complex is to shut down. We look for simple solutions to complex problems, but to, to learn how to stay open 
So that is one sort of transformational skill. Another one could be, again, as we said before, to be able to see the world in more nuance and, and depth, to take more perspectives on the world, and to uh, increase your emotional capacity, not the least um, empathy that, that we mentioned. And how do you do this? Well, you, you, you can't go on, on just a, a three-day course. And then all of a sudden you are able to take a lot of more perspectives of, of the world and integrate them in a, in a more nuanced and complex way. No, but if you are in the right environment for a long time, and I'm a, I'm a great believer in, in the power of nature when it comes to this uh, transformative uh, learning. And that is why my foundation, we have our own retreat center out in the Stockholm archipelago. Uh, but I'm also aware of the fact that retreats in nature uh, is an expensive um, way of doing that. And that is why my foundation, together with the Norsian Foundation in Stockholm, has taken the initiative to develop a digital platform, a non-profit, uh, open source, co-created dig digital platform called 29K uh, that, free of charge, help people to uh, develop these uh, transformative skills um, but it takes time and you need to be in a group and if you are asking for how do you do it then the simple answer is that you need to create a trusting environment uh, so you feel safe but then you need to allow yourself to be challenged you need to have your your perspectives and your feelings challenged and you need to meet new perspectives and new ways of looking on yourself, looking on the world and uh, looking at society and, and try to reach the blind spots that we all have in our, in our view of ourselves and, and of the world. And that is where deep psychology comes in because all of this involves learning on a very deep psychological level that is almost unconscious. So it's unconscious uh, learning that you need to, uh, to, to reach. So in, instead of singing and walking the nature and discussions, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interactions, how would such a retreat effectively become one in the world of 21st century and the, the online technology that, that you yeah. are exploring yeah. how to integrate? So, of course, we, we have... Uh, we perceive, uh, uh, from... excuse me, uh, we perceive um, uh, the online communication like a, like a, like a more shallow uh, yeah. way of communicating. So how to bridge, how to bridge that? Yeah. So uh, in our initiative 29K, we, we are, of course, looking at uh, what happened at these centers in uh, uh, Scandinavia that were called folk high schools but we also have the very rich tradition of uh, retreat centers from all over the world that has during the 19th century sorry the 20th century uh, been uh, developing contemporary techniques for for doing this and one can mention centers like uh, the Esalen Institute in 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 California uh, for, for example, where a lot of these psychological techniques have been developed during the second half of, of the 20th century. And the challenging question when we started with the 29K project was, was of course, is it possible to replicate anything of this, what we have learned in real life in a digital environment? And to our surprise, we, we saw that these sharing circles that have always been so important for these transformative learning, these trusted circles where you can feel, feel trusted and free to experiment, but where you are also challenged in your beliefs and, and your blind spots. Could that be replicated digitally? And we found that yes, having these small video sharing groups, uh, can actually replicate these trusting environments very, very well. And I think we have all now during the pandemic been surprised of 
how well uh, virtual video conference meetings like the Zoom conversation we have today, how close that actually comes to uh, a meeting in, in, in real life. So, uh, so far we have very promising evaluations of these digital circles. But as you started to point out, these transformation and the transformation of learning that really happens in a group situation and you really need the human contact for that to happen. But uh, it looks like it can be digitally transmitted. And how, how did the system manage to avoid bad actors who would lead people astray or indoctrinate? Well, um, I think that was very much, if you're going to, if we're now going back to the folk high schools in, in Scandinavia, these centers in Scandinavia a hundred years ago, how, 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 how was this working? I think this was working quite a lot from a, um, a self-organizing and self-adjusting perspective. Um, but of course, um, once uh, you had state funding for these centers, then of course you had a little bit of control in that way. But the, uh, those who invented this system, they were very keen on also the running and the way that these centers were organized should also be a bottom up approach. So there were central financing but very decentralized organization of these centers. And they were organized by different organizations. So um, in some parts of, of, of the Nor Nordic countries, the workers unions played an important role. The um, uh, r religious organizations played an important role. Sports organizations, temperance movement uh, played a role and the programs were different and certainly contained a bit of different political angles. I mean, whether they were organized by a, by a workers unions organization or a, by a, a religious organization, but the idea of the free thinking and being allowed to challenge all ideas and really connecting not to an outside source of authority, but reaching towards your own inner authority. Th that was shared by all organizers. And that was part of the requisite, the, the very few requisites, but a few requisites for uh, being able to tap into these governmental funding programs. Mm -hmm.